Sean Covey is the son of the educator and uh, marketing expert and, and uh, expert in management studies, uh, Stephen Covey, who famously wrote Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And Sean himself has become a motivational speaker in his own right and travels widely giving presentations on similar themes. And several years ago, he was traveling internationally and had a layover in some far-flung place from the United States. And he tells the story of getting off of his flight and buying a bag of chips for a snack. And he finds a table, sits down, and quickly gets absorbed in checking his phone, looking at his notes for the upcoming presentation, wherever it is that he is ultimately headed. And in the midst of being distracted by these various things that he's looking at, someone sits down across from him. And as he's still looking at his notes, he hears his bag of chips open. And he looks up, and this person who, uh, as he tells it, is clearly not uh, from the United States, is from a different cultural background, and may have somewhat of a tenuous grasp on English, has opened his bag of chips and is eating it. And he is very troubled and shocked by this behavior, but doesn't quite know how to respond. So he decides he's not going to make a fuss about it. He reaches over and grabs a chip himself. And as he eats the chips, this person is eating almost double the amount. You know, they're working through the bag quite quickly. And so he's kind of getting this this more bothered look on his face and he starts giving this person kind of dirty glances as he's eating the chips and they finish the bag person takes the empty package walks away throws it away and kind of goes on their business and sean just can't get this experience out of his mind it's annoying him and he's frustrated that this person had the audacity to eat his bag of chips so he gets to his flight he opens his briefcase to get his boarding pass out, and there are his bag of chips. He was eating this other person's bag of chips. All the while upset and frustrated that they had the audacity to eat his chips. And that's such a beautiful example of the parable and the, the lesson in the parable that we hear today from Jesus in St. Luke chapter 18. Because at the end of the day, the difference between this Pharisee and this tax collector are not necessarily the behaviors that they are conducting in their day-to-day -day life, but the way in which they are oriented towards those behaviors, the way in which they have oriented themselves to God. Because in a true and fundamental sense, both of them are broken people. Both of them have limitations and challenges and ways in which they fall short, like Sean did in this experience. But one is able to recognize those places of brokenness and be honest about them. And the other tamps them down, hides them away, and only sees the righteousness, only sees the place of justification, only stands in the place of judgment. And what does Jesus teach us today but to not stand in that place of judgment ourselves, but to let God be that place, that judge, and to sit and stand in that place of judgment himself. This, I think, as we have been going on these last several weeks with this B campaign and reflecting on Micah 6, 8, this week's lesson is probably the most clear link that we have in our lectionary readings to that fundamental call that we hear in Micah to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. 
this parable that we hear today centers us in that admonition. And I think it particularly centers us around those two admonitions to love kindness and to walk humbly. So what do we hear in today's lesson about those two admonitions? What does it mean to love kindness? Well, I think as we hear Jesus' parable, the loving kindness bit is the call not to stand in judgment. Even when we think things are going well for ourselves, it is not for us to judge the situations and circumstances of other people. See, it seems as though the Pharisee is sort of violating two separate precepts. It's not simply that he is proudly flaunting or flouting his own righteousness, his own goodness, and putting that on display for the world to see, but it's that he is additionally putting down everyone else. As he says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people not like other people. And there, there are times in our lives where we may feel very certain about what it is that God is calling us into. I don't know about you, but I have had those moments in life where it, it seems as though the direction and the decisions that I am supposed to make are quite certain and quite clear. I've been blessed with that sense of clarity. But even in those moments of certainty, we need to have a generous spirit in relationship to those who see things differently. And I think as we consider our entire relationship to the objectives and the call of the B campaign, this idea that we are to have a reoriented life in relationship especially to the political climate in our country right now, and the deep sort of concrete bifurcation that society wants to put on that political climate. The idea of loving kindness is a fundamental reorientation in that circumstance. Because on either side of the political spectrum, we may feel very strongly and very certain about the things that are of value to us, the things that we feel are things of God, the things that we feel are fundamental truths that are unassailable. But we need, even in that certainty, to have a generosity of spirit to those who think differently. Because we don't know their circumstances. We don't know their life. We don't know their thought processes. We don't know why it is that they have come to a different conclusion. And in being in relationship with them, we have an opportunity to step back and, and certainly continue to hold firmly to our own beliefs and our own values but to be generous in hearing their story, to being generous to hearing another perspective and another side. The great Northern Irish theologian Peter Rawlins has talked about this principle, this process, in terms of holding things gently. He, he uses this beautiful sort of image using hands of talking about so often when we have values in our life, things that we hold to be fundamentally true and important, we hold them in clenched fists because we don't want anything to attack them. We want to protect those truths from any kind of assault. And in holding them in clenched fists, we, we are almost in that place of battle ready to fight and fend off any challenge. 
And he says, that's not the place that God calls us into. Instead, the place that God calls us into is to hold those truths, to hold those values, to hold those commitments. And it's important to have all of those things, to have truths and commitments that we, we hold on to, but to hold on to them gently, to hold on to them in hands that are spread out so that whatever layers of a additional material get wrapped around those truths that that are layers of material that don't really matter over time that those things begin to shed those things begin to fall away that we find that the core truth that we're holding on to is a lot more basic and a lot more simple than the layers of things that we want to add on to it and at the end of the day, when all of those other things fall away, what we're left with is the fundamental truth that has been the point all along. So his invitation is not to clench the fist, but to keep an open and honest posture, a generous posture, letting those other things fall away. And in that generosity, there is the companion issue of humility. It's the second part of this. To love kindness is necessarily to also be humble and to have a humility of spirit, recognizing that there are many times when we don't quite call things right, when even with good intentions, we fail to do what it is that we have fundamentally been called to do in our lives. On that point, I think that we are especially, we are especially uh, oriented towards what the confession in our extra liturgical source, the Enriching Our Worship series offers in terms of its reflection on what confession means. EOW uses or offers this alternative confession that says, God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. And all sort of similar to our standard confession. But then it goes on to say this, we repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. And that's, that's such a beautiful admission because so often we are doing exactly what we think we should be doing or ought to be doing. And even when we do that, there are times when things are done on our behalf or by others, by systems that we support that are fundamentally broken behaviors, that are fundamentally harmful and hurtful behaviors that fundamentally alienate others from God, even when that has not been our own intention. And so the place of humility is to be open to recognizing that there are times when even when we thought we've done the right thing, we've fallen short. We've fallen short. But what we hear what we hear in Jesus' parable today is that by walking humbly and by loving kindness, even when we fall short, that's not the end of the story. Because Jesus says nothing about the behaviors of this tax collector and this Pharisee in their life beyond this one little experience and circumstance. It may be that in the course of daily living, the Pharisee, in most respects, is living a much more, uh, uh, much more grounded life of service, of dedication, of commitment to other people than the tax collector. And it may be that the tax collector is involved in all sorts of nefarious undertakings. But what we know is that in this moment, the tax collector is recognizing his own brokenness, his own limitation, 
and asking God to transform those places and systems in his life that have perpetuated that brokenness and to give him a renewal of spirit and a rejuvenation of spirit that will let him live more holy and more holistically going forward. And that's the call for us. The call for us is not to live a so totally and justified and sanctified life that we never have to worry about these things again. It's the call for an orientation and a location and a way of living that in each and every moment we can do the best that we can do. We can follow the precepts that God puts before us as fully and as robustly as we can. But be honest and understanding and gentle when we fall short. But when we fall short, to turn back to God in that honesty and admit that we haven't quite hit the mark. That our way of living, our behaviors, our sins continue to permeate the goodness that we set out to do. And we ask forgiveness for that. We ask for a rejuvenation of spirit and a recommitment so that we might do better in the future. And that, fundamentally, at the end of the day, is what humility is about. Humility is not about fixing every single thing and never have to worry about it again, but instead in each and every moment to have that fundamental orientation of openness so that as we do the best that we can do, we may hear the call of God ever more fully in our lives and admit and acknowledge the times when things haven't gone the way we expected or haven't gone the way they ought to have gone. And to be honest and open about that. To take those moments to God in confession and to plead for a sense of rejuvenation and restoration of spirit. And in a final sense, that's, at the end of the day, what we are called and capable of doing. As we hear over and over again in the Old Testament and even in our lesson from Timothy today, the fact is that we are constantly in that struggle because of our own human frailties. And God does not judge us simply and exclusively on those places of fallenness. But God ultimately judges us on the ways that we respond to those times of brokenness and fallenness. What God offers us is a return and restoration. And so, as will happen in our lives, when we fall short, when we sense brokenness, when we find ourselves in that place of holding too rigidly to things we need to let go of, we have an opportunity to acknowledge and confess that, and an opportunity to do better in the future. It's what God invites us into today through the parable that he offers in Jesus. And it's the invitation to us in each and every moment of our lives. And I pray today that each of us, and as a whole community of faith, we as St. Anne's, might more robustly acknowledge our own limitations and turn anew to God, letting his justification, his judgment, his invitation to restoration, rejuvenate our spirit, restore us to wholeness, and give us that sense of peace which passes all understanding, and give us that new day in which we may stand justified in him and pledge to do better now and in the future. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.